Nevin Thompson. Nevin, today you're in Victoria, Canada. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I'm it's, uh, on an island in the Pacific Ocean uh, near Vancouver and Seattle. About eight hours by yeah. plane from uh, Tokyo. Okay, so not too long of a flight. I spent a month in uh, Victoria, uh, Vancouver Island, I believe it's called. So you that's right. you are near University of Victoria, is that right, you Vic? Yeah, that's where I graduated. My son's there right now. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, my students yeah. many years ago were studying there. So thank you so much for joining us from across the sea. Sure. Now, Nevin, how did you get started in your career as a writer? Or tell us a little bit how you're connected to Japan <laughs> as well. Well, uh, I graduated from uh, University of Victoria in um, the 90s, in mid 90s. And uh, I have a writing degree. And so I um, learned how to, to write uh, the perfect Raymond Carver short story. I also learned some uh, like journalism stuff that I still use. But, you know, back in the 90s, like the, there was a recession. It was pretty brutal. And there have been years of restraint here. Like Victoria at the time was a government town. And uh, there was like restraint, they called it, like cutbacks. And so it was kind of dead here. And at that time, you could still get a job by hopping on a plane and going to Japan to teach English. And that's what I did. Uh, I ended up in Noto, the Noto Peninsula. <laughs> and uh, nobody told me that, like, on the Noto Peninsula is, is basically the same as, like, even more rural than, you know, Vancouver Island, Canada. And so I kind of biked around Noto and then got a job in... Um, in Toyama and Kurobe at the YKK Zipper Factory, their head headquarters, and I got I just answered a, 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 a call in the uh, Japan Times. Like at that time, there was no internet. This is like pre-internet. So I'm, I'm like divorced from like reality. Like there's no, I couldn't read Japanese or any, anything like that. I couldn't talk, speak. Um, it's like very rural Inaka, as they say. Uh, so. And I, my only communication in the outside world was like the Japan Times, which was at the library of, in, in, the, in the, the place in Noto where I was living. I answered an ad, got a job, and then spent 10 years in Japan. Uh, how did I become a writer, though? I mean, that's another long story. So I'm, I'm not sure if you have any any questions or want the clarification there. But there's that's another kind of meandering. <laughs> how did I how yeah. did I become a writer? Well, we're uh, going to talk about uh, some of your amazing articles today, which are focused on Japan and discussions of very serious topics that need more discussion. And I'm so I'm really happy that you're still, even though you're not in Japan, you are focused on these important topics. And you've been writing for um, Global Voices. Can you tell us a little bit about Global, Global Voices. Voices? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, until COVID hit, we actually spent part of the year in in, in Japan, in, in Fukui. In Fukui Prefecture is uh, north of Kyoto on the Japan Sea. It's pretty famous for nuclear power plants. That's about it. Nobody goes there. It's got, it's got like some pretty awesome places to hike and really good food. And there's like like the head of uh, Soto Zen is at Eiji and and there's all this really cool stuff there, but nobody goes there because they do a terrible job of, of, of marking the place. But I, I spent part of the year there uh, until COVID. And so that's been sort of allowed me to, like my kids go to school or have gone to school there. Um, but that has nothing to do with Global Voices. So so like when I was in Japan, I started writing for Kansai Time Out, uh, which, which is an old magazine. It was pre, kind of pre-internet and bridge to internet, but it was a very popular magazine in like... Uh, Osaka and Kobe and, and Kyoto. And I wrote some stuff for Kyoto Journal and, and that sort of thing. And then I took a hiatus from writing because we came back to Canada and I had to, to earn a living and you can't really earn a living as a writer, right? At the time I wasn't able to, but I did writing adjacent things. Um, and then um, I but actually know that's right. So about 2005, 
at the start of the era of like online, like citizen media, I wrote some stuff for Global Voices. Uh, Global Voices is like a, it started out, Global Voices, it's uh, globalvoices.org, it started out as a um, kind of like a, a blog about uh, Western Africa. So Ethan Zuckerman, uh, who used to teach at MIT, he's now at UMass, Amherst. Um, He's one of the founders and Rebecca McKinnon. And so they kind of, were, they wanted to, to at the time back in the early 2000s, um, engage the world with global voices. Because at that time there was like blogging was, was really big, but most of the blogs focused on the United States. And so what they wanted to do back then was bridge from all these different like regions around the world. And so what, over the past uh, 16 years, 17 years, 16 years, it's kind of grown into a kind of a news organization. And so we we uh, have correspondents in like every part of the world. Like we have editors that cover every, every region of the world. I'm uh, the Japan editor, but there's also like um, uh, somebody who covers uh, PRC, like, like uh, uh, the Communist China, the mainland China, there's somebody who who covers um, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, South Asia, Central Asia, uh, Eastern Africa, Western Africa, and that sort of thing. And so so it's basically like we're kind of a, a news organization where we, we do like journalists, we produce journalistic articles about various countries. I'm kind of a rarity because I'm not Japanese, <laughs> but I report on Japan. Uh, but most of the people have are, are from the region they report on, and and have deep deep knowledge. I, I mean, I think I have some pretty good knowledge of Japan. But um, th but so it's it's just a way to uh, it, it's a platform for like, like a news site. We have like a newsroom. Uh, we have like a, a newsroom protocols and workflows. And so I was working with um, a sub editor this afternoon on a story and I'm working with a volunteer and we're doing some, some data journalism, some data visualization using the Twitter AI, API. So, but it's, but we produce journalistic articles. We focus on uh, digital rights. And so you may not know it, but um, in, in Nigeria, for example, uh, Twitter is banned, which is kind of a big deal. Or we talk about internet shutdowns, um, in whatever country you would like to think about, um, like say if there's an election in, in some countries, it's it's common to just stop the internet. <laughs> so we, we talk about digital rights, um, we talk about human rights and that sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, that's what Global Voice is about. But I, I just I just like report on Japan and they kind of let me report on whatever the hell I want. <laughs> whatever strikes my fancy. Well, I find that's such an interesting span in your writing career, because like you said, you started out before there was even the internet. But now I yeah. notice in, in your articles, you're really bringing in voices from social media as a part of your news reporting. So yeah. what, what, is, what is your process? Like trying to get from a variety of sources, like legitimate newspapers, but also personal social media reports, as well as experts like professors? Yeah. Well, I mean, like there's lots of reporting on Japan in English, right? Like the time, New York Times has got a bureau there and and uh, Guardian, Economist, uh, Financial Times, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they, and so they kind of, they do a great job of covering the country, um, but, but they focus on specific kinds of stories with specific kinds of sources. Uh, so what I try to do is I try to find stories that probably wouldn't get covered immediately. Sometimes they do. Sometimes the story blows up and gets legs, like real legs. But uh, but my, I so I just try to, to find stories. Um, like, like say if you're like in in the states or the UK or something, and you you're not connected to Japan in any way, and, and they speak Chinese there because I've, I've had people say that. Oh. You live in Japan, you speak Chinese? 
I'm like, what the hell? But I mean, because for some people, it's like, ah, it's just over there. And in, in, in being in Japan, of course, like nobody knows what the difference is between a Canadian and American. So it's like it's kind of the same thing. So so, but if you're like in in like the UK or the US, like if you want to, if you ever read about Japan, you would probably read something in the Times, or the Guardian. But there's actually other sources, like the actual vernacular media. And so what I try to do is I try to to report on what people are, are talking about in Japan. And so that could be like, um, I really like tabloids, like Nikon Sports. Um, for example, I really like the tabloids, but but also like there's like social media influencers, um, people who are talking about things. There's like total idiots who are social media influencers that I'll follow because they're like, like just like in, in English language, Twitter, they say outrageous things. There's people who are talking about really important stories. Um, like, like uh, you know, as you know, I wrote about um, that terrible uh, train attack in Tokyo. Yeah, I, I've got that on screen now, and I I thought you did a, a really good job of bringing in a variety of voices on, on yeah, that one. Thanks. Let's let's talk about that a little bit more. Well, yeah. So, so like I noticed this that um, like 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 a train attack is is happens. And it's terrible. And the guy said, yes, I targeted women, which is terrible enough. But then what I noticed was like people in, like women in English, like in English and Japanese and in Japanese were saying how afraid it made them feel. And and then also I noticed that other women were saying we're, we're getting pushback from like, like men saying, well, Japan's a safe country. And I mean, like here, realistically, you're, you're not going to like nobody's going to attack you on a train and so that kind of i thought that kind of found that kind of offensive um because like people like women were saying you know we feel afraid we felt afraid before now we feel even more afraid and then you have the other counter narrative japan is a very safe country and so and i i you know being a man in japan you know i always thought that it's like oh yeah japan's safe i left my wallet on a train but meanwhile i kind of was hearing stories over the years from women that i knew who had a completely different experience you know, so and it's not something I mean, I might have reported on occasionally, but it's not something I've ever really reported on. So I thought, you know, it'd be kind of a good idea just to investigate this a bit further, because like, as you know, like people say, Japan's very safe. But okay, is it you really? Have a, you have a great quote in the in the article from uh, Dr. Sayaka Shantani. And yeah. uh, what what she says, uh, you translated from her tweet in Japanese. Um, I think it's mostly a myth that Japan is a safe country. In our society, every day women must live in fear of groping, sexual harassment, and the threat of being <clears throat> murdered. Who exactly is saying that Japan is safe? And that I, I, you know, I've lived in Japan for many years. I've raised kids here. I'm a woman, uh, not in Tokyo, but I do feel that the country is very safe, and I feel uh fine walking around at night alone and i wouldn't worry about my kids doing that but to reevaluate the meaning of what is it to be safe and as a woman on a crowded train are you safe and is there something that you can do if you are groped or sexually assaulted is there something that does happen so these are all really important questions to be asking and i thought you did a great job in your article bringing that up just facts ma'am <laughs> i'm i'm but a mayor a container a vessel for expressing this stuff <laughs> So yeah, I mean it's, it's more the woman that uh, kind of informed it, right? Because like it, you know, it's great. Twi Japan Twitter is awesome because there's all these people there talking about their stuff. So I just basically sort of listen in and try to you know amplify some of the voices if I can, you know. But it was pretty nerve wracking writing about it, though. <laughs> I didn't want to get it wrong. It was interesting. It was interesting. You talked uh, about Sayaka Shantani, Shantani. But you also uh, got a quote from Dr. DeCook, Julia DeCook, yeah. and it, it kind of expanded it to not just an issue we need to talk about in Japan. And I thought that was really interesting. Did you interview her by telephone? Oh, no, just email. I'm pretty lazy. Uh -huh. So I just sent, uh, I, just, I usually send uh, questions for people to answer. <laughs> or yeah, I guess sometimes I do uh, in-person interviews or Skype interviews or whatever, Zoom. 
Um, I, that was actually kind of interesting because, like, I reached out to somebody else because, because, like, with the train attack, there was also like a meme or a discussion about incels and uh, stochastic terrorism. And this is an example of of, of, of stochastic misogynistic terrorism. And so, um, and I know I know somebody from Twitter once again who who writes about. Uh, um, yeah, Japanese online communities like Nichan. Is it Nichan? Is that how you pronounce it? I, just, I never actually said it aloud. But but, he, yeah, yeah. but this person writes about that. Um, and I wanted to know about, is this like an example of like uh, sort of bubbling organized male terrorism online? Because you, you see, you can connect the dots between this and there was like, there's been attacks in Canada in recent years, similar sorts of attacks, like a van attack and there's stuff in the States. And he's like, well, don't talk to me. You should talk to, you should talk to, uh, to Cook, Doctor Cook, because because she's she's actually an expert on on uh, male identities online and, and and misogyny and that sort of thing. So so I was put in touch with her, and I was like, are, are these terrorists? And then I was, you know, I had a very nuanced, uh, interesting discussion, uh, which I recorded and in, in, in reported in in the story, which in, in yeah. this. In, Summary is like no, it's not. It's it's more. Let's take it take it back a step, and this is sort of like actually, like the, the thing that women have to deal with all the time. It's not like something some new thing. It's misogyny. Yeah. The patriarchy, as uh, they say. Her her quote in the article uh, that you did is: I don't think the Tokyo train attack is an example of far right extremism towards women, but rather a harrowing example of how violent and fatal misogyny and backlash against feminism and women's rights is for Japan, said de Cook. The violent misogyny that women are subjected to in everyday circumstance and day to day is an example of how patriarchy exerts political control through these often private fear tactics and terror. I thought that was really powerful. and. It's, it's something that is really important to talk about in terms of sustainability. How you treat women in society, um, how a lot of women in Japan uh, have insecure contracts with businesses, how they're treated unfairly in terms of not only promotion or hiring or uh, the wage gap, but in other ways too, you know, there's, yeah. there's so many, so many aspects of gender imbalance, which when you then have violence against women or sexual assault against women, which women start to feel this is normal for Japan, and we have to question it and we have to talk about the bigger picture <clears throat> and the repercussions of accepting this as normal, right? Yeah, I, I mean, it certainly makes me kind of rethink my entire experience in, in Japan over the past, what, 25 plus years and things that I thought maybe were things I just accepted, like, you know, well, you kind of have to in some ways, but, 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 but you know, a woman offering tea or, or a woman having to quit uh, when they have a baby and, and all that sort of stuff. And, but other many, many other things too. So. Yeah, but yeah, I suddenly I'm kind of re re rethinking how I think about uh, uh, my relationship with Japan and, and, and how to, yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was it's a it's an important piece to talk about, and it's not just about targeting women. Uh, Japan Times also talked about the same attacker and his plans to do a bigger attack on couples yeah. in Shibuya Crossing. And this is mirrored in a lot of other countries too. A lot of domestic violence attackers actually go on to create bigger crimes against society at large. So this is something, if we can address domestic violence, if we can address uh, gender uh, targeted uh, violence, then maybe we can protect community at large, right? There are a lot of real interesting connections here. Yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. And they're, and they're universal too, like, like we were saying, because those sorts of attacks occur in Canada, for example, and, I, and we know they do in, in the States and New Zealand and the UK. Actually, yeah, what, what kind of, what actually prompted me to to reach out to my contact and Twitter who put me in touch with Dr. Cook was, uh, it was the, 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 there was a shooting, a mass shooting in the UK. And I thought, oh, is there a, is there a connection? Because like this, this person also was like really anti-woman and Etc. So those are a connection, but but we saw what the like what our discussion was when you reported that. Yeah, it's it's often like the like the cook says in in your article. It's often is connected um, to a lot of other violent acts, and so if we can address uh, these, you know, seemingly small uh, attacks in terms of even sexual harassment, that maybe we can stop things as it progresses later on down the line. So it's it's all important to be talking about and, and raising these issues. Um, I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about the Battleship Island article you did, which also sure. has so many far reaching connections uh, in terms of Japanese history and everything. Uh, uh, yeah. Can you tell us uh, a about? bit about this article? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, um, yeah, well, I like Kyushu. Uh, I, I, and also I, I like, like when I, I originally got a history degree too. So I got like a double major creative writing and history, which whatever that means, all that means is I've read, I read some history books, but I, I've always been interested in history and, um, always like wanting to learn like, like the real stuff because there's like the, um, official version of events versus like what really happened and also been very interested, always been very interested in, in Korean communities in Japan and that sort of thing. But, but also I just like, I really like Nagasaki and I really like Kyushu and I often with on a family vacations, so we go to Nagasaki cause it's like so awesome. It's like the best food. It's like, the best, most interesting, multi-layered history. Um, Kyushu is like amazing as well, and and so when we go to Nagasaki, we usually stay in like um, I can't remember what it's called. It's like the Oedo Spa. It's like 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 this this uh, Oedo Onsen. So like Oedo bought um, a whole bunch of old um, bubble era hotels and renovated them, and they must have cost like. You know, five hundred bucks a night, like thirty years ago, but now that now it's like a cheap family vacation. These really like the little like uh, kind of tiny Showa era hotel rooms, like tatami mats, and but the baths are amazing. And on top of that, you, you look right out over see right. That's that's from our hotel window, and I was like, holy cow, because you can see like the entire history. And so that that's the uh, the electric cantilever crane of the Mitsubishi shipyards and to the left of it is where like uh, uh, Mitsubishi built their, they, they laid down the hall of the uh, uh, Musashi, which is like the, the, like the, the, the Yamato's uh, sister ship, but the largest battleship in the world. And, and then uh, there's still like an active shipyard there. They build uh, gas, uh, gas tankers and uh, they do refits or they're, they're doing the, the fitting out of like the new Aegis destroyers and stuff. So I'm like, wow, that's really cool. And so, so, and then, and then you see like the, uh, Japan's Meiji industrial revolution stuff. If you go to whoever gardens and that's really cool too. Cause there's like this entire like integrated history that's right before your eyes where you can see like, uh, cause right across from the crane is like Japan's first dry dog and, and Thomas Glover, who was like a gun, a gun runner who, who started up uh, the mine in Hashima with its, what became Mitsubishi. And so I have always wanted to write about that. But then um, <clears throat> uh, I realized that uh, there's actually more to the history than what the Japanese government's trying to, to describe. And that was actually more important to me. It was because like, um, so, so Battleship Island or Hashima, um, it's now I think a World Heritage Site and it's like it's just like it, it looks kind of creepy it looks like a big battleship but in, in reality if you go there it was just like a, a thriving town built on a coal mine on an island and it and uh, we, like if you go to the island i'm not sure if you can right now but like it's like the tours are organized by former residents and they, they were like genuinely happy to live there even though it looks like crap 
it's like i mean it looks like it looks like japan looked like some of the towns in like uh backwoods japan look when i first came in the, the mid 90s like it's sort of like these this concrete <laughs> hastily put together concrete like fukui city because it, it fukui city was bombed and then uh and then they rebuilt and then like a gigantic earthquake hit fukui city and so they're like ah the hell with it and they just put up like these ugly like concrete buildings like that <laughs> So it kind of reminded me of home, but, but anyways, um, but, but the, so, so people liked it there, but then if you dig deeper, you realize that, uh, during the war, these mines all over Kyushu, which are, which are, are official world heritage sites, they actually use slave labor or enslaved people. Uh, so Hashima, Battleship Island, which has been in the James Bond movie, it, uh, they, they used conscripted, uh, Korean laborers to dig out coal and, and a number of people died there. But then, like in other other um, uh, mines and industrial sites uh, in Nagasaki, but also like in Kumamoto and other places in Kyushu, they might use um, uh, a, a POWs to to uh, dig coal or offload ships or build things. And in, in we know that uh, in, in Hiroshima and also in Nagasaki, a number of uh, American POWs were, were killed in the in the bomb blast, as well as, as of course conscripted uh, Korean laborers. Um, and so that was just interesting to me because it's like, 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 uh, how could these be like UNESCO world heritage sites when they, they ignore that? And then like, it doesn't matter because like UNESCO, like the UN is like told Japan, you gotta, you gotta fix this. You gotta tell people cause you promised, cause like Japan promised to tell the story about the, about the enslaved and conscripted laborers that died, but Japan has sort of ignored them said, nah, we're not gonna do it. And they have like, I think, until December or something to file a response, but even if they, even if the Japanese government doesn't do anything, doesn't clarify the matter, it, they, they still remain as UNESCO World Heritage sites. I thought um, UNESCO was giving a deadline of they have to disclose the information about uh, forced labor by December next year, yeah. or they will pull the UNESCO status. Is that not right? Does, does my article say that? I'm I, I don't think sure it does. It says that clearly. No, but that's oh, okay. what so I, I can go back and edit it. it was no, it was an nothing, ultimatum. No. I thought no. No, it's just though you, you must do that. But if even if they don't, like like I think, well, I don't. I, I mean, I think it's unspoken. But I think uh, someplace else I I looked at. But uh, there's only been like in the history of UNESCO World Heritage sites. I think only two have had their status revoked, and I think in each case it's because the um, the site that had been called a World Heritage Site had been destroyed or irre irrevocably altered. So those are like sort of yeah. that's the only criteria for re revoking the, the World Heritage in, status. In terms of uh, sustainable tourism, this often comes up, right? Like I, I'm in Hiroshima, so I'm near Miyajima Island. I'm really appreciative of the UNESCO guidelines for uh, how much you can build around UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So around the floating Itsukushima Shrine, all the buildings are classic and low build. And I, I give some credit back to UNESCO applying pressure to help that preservation and i'm i'm hoping even if they don't revoke unesco world heritage status that they are adding pressure for more disclosure of the history from these uh industrial uh sites uh, 23 of them around kyushu it's not just yeah. battleship island right yeah, there's, there's, uh, I don't have the article in front of me, uh, but uh, uh, as I recall, there's a, there's a mine site, there's another mine site in, in Nagasaki and one in Kumamoto at least that uh, employed uh, forced, forced labor, never people died. Um, by the way, like, I'm not sure if UNESCO really cares, because <laughs> it's kind of inconvenient. So, so like, it, like, it's, I linked to the article, like, I linked, sorry, I linked to the documents in my article, but there's like, um, there's like like meeting notes from a UNESCO meeting where they talk about this from, oh gosh, it was a few months ago, but it's it's in the article someplace, but it's it's actually South Korea that's sort of raising a stink about this, because I think South Korea sits sits on the community too, and so South Korea is like registered formal complaints that because um, because the deal was like, sure, Japan's Meiji Industrial Revolution, the twenty three sites will be named collectively a world heritage site but 
Japan has to promise to to uh, disclose and discuss uh, at one at, at certain points um, use of of uh, a penal colony like convicts like convicts who are conscripted so Japanese convicts this is back like uh, in the the Meiji era at the start of it they used they used like like uh, prisoners in a, in, a, in a prison and then they during during um, the colonization period of the Korean Peninsula, they, they, the Korean conscripts were, were used and POWs, and so they were supposed to, but they didn't. And uh, so, so that's what is so. But I think UNESCO and probably like any large organization regards this as kind of a, an irritation. How it's I mean, it's sure it's important, but it's it's, it's because of like Korea, South Korea, that's uh, that's raised the issue and has championed this issue, issue. And that's in the in some of the the documents that I link to. Well, if you're, if you're talking about uh, tourism sites in Kyushu, uh, most uh, visitors, I would imagine, to those sites are probably Koreans. And uh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot yeah. of visitors from Korea in Kyushu. And so in terms of uh, being accountable and transparent, it makes sense from a tourism point of view. If you know this part of your country's history and you visit somewhere, you want it to be truthfully or at least the basic level of honesty represented. And it, it was very similar in Hiroshima, right? When Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, how they talk about the war. Do they talk about the activities of Japan? before the bomb was dropped, right? These are very political nuances which make big impressions on visitors from around the world. It's part of transparency and accountability, which is so important. And I think in this way, tourism can really help because you want the tourist to trust you that you're trying to represent what happened here in an accurate way, right? It's meaningful. No. <laughs> well, I wonder about that actually. I wonder. I, I so I, I live here in Victoria in a tourism town, and um, I live actually a block from like the tourist, the heart of the tourist area. It's the, the Inner Harbor, and there's like the, the provincial legislature. It looks really it's very photogenic, and then there's the so-called there's the Empress Hotel. It was made by Canada Steamship Lines, like uh, I don't know, 100 years ago. It's very, also very photogenic. Um, and we have like this sort of like colonial history where we're called like British Columbia. Uh, there's a statue of friggin' Queen Victoria. Uh, the, the local newspaper here is called the Times Colonist. And you, you'd never know that actually uh, First Nations people, Indigenous people have lived here for like like 10,000 years. It's only until recently. So, and, and, I, and I think I think um, tourists tend to tend to 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 not really care. It's more about the experience and ticking things off a list. I think I think it would be good to be transparent, but um, I don't know. Like like there's it's almost like also with this like this Meiji Industrial Revolution, it's kind of like information overload. I mean, for somebody like me, I'm like, wow, that's the electric cantilever crane. But I think a lot of people like. I think it's important though because like because I think it's easy for tourists to to just sort of accept the narrative. Because they don't have the energy or the inclination to dig deeper, it's just it's not they're not history nerds. So I think that's why it's because otherwise it's really easy actually to spin a story if you if you have a tourist if you have a tourist uh, destination because nobody's paying attention. They they are kind of like a, a captive audience where you can you know tell whatever narrative you want and they'll accept it. And so I think that's actually the more insidious danger. I think I think now in terms of. Uh, people using social media, you can check information quite easily from multiple sources. Uh, when you visit a site, especially a historical site, and they're not completely transparent or honest about what happened, I think that really turns people off and they will share it on their social media and that damages your brand. Um, I think Hiroshima has done it really well. They've tried to represent what Japan was doing during the wartime, as well as what happened in the bombing and after with recovery. Um, I think places like Battleship Island, they can be honest and still retain pride in the Industrial Revolution. 
I think there is a, a very good way to do that in terms of branding and re retaining respect from visitors um, to your site. It's it's important and something worth talking about. Um, actually, uh, that's actually kind of an interesting thing talking about Hiroshima versus uh, Nagasaki. Um, I just purchased a book called uh, Resurrecting Nagasaki. And I'm just trying to, I'm trying to figure out who the, the, the author is, um, but it's by Cornell Press, but it, it talks about, it, it compared the, the book, the author, who's Professor Cornell, it's a recent book, it's called Resurrecting Nagasaki. It compares uh, how Hiroshima is like an atom bomb town, whereas Nagasaki is it, it, like, it was, it was a conscious decision not to brand the city uh, as being like a, like a victim of, of atomic attack. Um, and so it kind of erased actually the history, like literally erased or eradicated the history of it. Because um, if you've ever been to Nagasaki, um, like Urakami, like the, the bomb site is kind of like the cathedral is gone. Like there's some like, there's a peace park, but like they tore down, like they're like compared to the, uh, whatever, like the trade center in the middle of Hiroshima, that re like the atom bomb dome, so-called. Uh, the whole the, peace park, the peace memorial park. They, Hiroshima yeah. had a, a lot of funding um, from the government. And one of the reasons, uh, there's a, amazing books on this written, and I don't want to dumb down any of their amazing research that they did, but, um, Hiroshima was the first to get a lot of government funding nationally. And one of the reasons they were able to create such a beautiful big facility, the Peace Park, um, was partially because they tied it to tourism and a way to connect tourism and um, future peace uh, activities and branding of Japan in what happened during the war. So it's, yeah. it's very complicated, very political. Um, and then Nagasaki in many ways lost out with funding. So it, it's a very distinct representation in their peace park. I've, I've been there a few times. It's an incredible place. Both Hiroshima and Nagasaki are well worth visiting. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Um, and the there, book is by, yeah. uh, oh, sorry. Go I was ahead, going to say this ahead. the book. I went to call out, out uh, Chad R. Deal, and Deal is spelled D I E H L, and it's called Resurrecting Nagasaki. It's uh, by Cornell Press. It's not cheap, but it's worth it if you order it. So I, I'm reading it right now. Yeah, it sounds interesting. Thank you. Um, I'll I'll add that to the the public chat in a in a minute. Um, one of the things that you do talk about in your articles is about battling misinformation. So in, I thought that was interesting, this uh, thing about historical uh, leaving out some information and then battling misinformation on social media. You did some articles about Twitter uh, in Japan, which I thought was really interesting. Do you want to talk about oh, yeah. that a little bit? Sure. I mean, so working with Mobile Voices uh, has been kind of transformational for me because, um, you know, I used to be like a like a teacher. Like at first I started as an English instructor and, and I taught taught it like I'm a, tra I'm a trained teacher. I have a bachelor of education as well. And I used to be a social studies teacher in Canada, taught it, taught in college in Japan, ran a, a, a cram school with my wife. We, we taught uh, exam prep. Moved back to Canada. I worked in, in government and stuff like that, and then did marketing. <laughs> I've done many things, but uh, Japan. I mean, sorry, Global Voices really uh, helped transform my world when I when I rejoined them in twenty fourteen after like almost like nine years uh, since like last written for them, and because um, like we do talk like like it, it's like like it's really interesting because uh, Global Voices. It sort of sits right in, in this like kind of nexus with with all these other like NGOs and, and the big platforms, and so it's like an opportunity to talk to Twitter and Facebook or report on them and provide feedback and, and interact in some ways. I mean, these are giant corporations, right? And and one thing that we do talk about a lot is like, like I mentioned earlier was um, digital rights, and and so for example, um, content moderation. We talk a lot about content moderation. Um, by, by different platforms, not just Twitter and Facebook, but others. 
Um, and so this, like, so there's always like, um, in, in, in also like, like um, freedom of expression, something that Google Voice talks about. And so I, I, I like to, to, when I can, I'm not an expert on it, but, but, but if I can pull up um, stories about um, how Twitter decides to, to delete comments or ban accounts in Japan. Uh, it's not, it's, 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 so Twitter in Japan can be very controversial. And you may have heard this before in other regions but of the world, but um, there's this, this assumption that, that Twitter skews right in Japan and that, that right-wing accounts that, that have like hate speech, they don't care about, but if, if a left-wing or a, a, an account critical of the government is too critical, the Twitter will like delete the tweet or whatever it does or ban the account. And there's, that's, there, there's this perception. So I like to report on that. And over the years, I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to just report on, on how people in Japan, like activists, um, have, have pressured uh, Twitter, which is the most popular, like, it's more popular than Facebook. It's, it, Twitter is like like really popular in Japan, by the way. Like more people per capita use Twitter than say the states. And so so there's been pressure uh, put on Twitter by activists to address like hate speech. And hate speech is typically um, aimed at uh, ethnic Koreans and or women, typically. And so so like people will go to the HQ and and uh, protest against Twitter because because like it'll take down like stuff that's sort of nominally critical of the government, it, but will leave up like the most vile racist stuff. So I, I, I do report on that, yeah. And I have lots of like, and I've, I've learned a lot of interesting things that I've been able to share with with others about like how uh, freedom of expression in Japan and how it's it, how, how it's um, enforced or whatever or whatever. So I'm kind of rambling here. No, <laughs> hopefully no, I'm mastering your questions. That was really interesting. And in the article on the Twitter misinformation, uh, in a Japanese language interview, uh, more Norman, Naman, uh, you you talk about in the, the article, he's a researcher at Cornell, says that Twitter tends to focus its moderation efforts on English language. And according to data collected, analyzed by Naman's team, other languages on the Twitter Aye. platform such as Japanese, enjoy fewer resources when it comes to moderation policies. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that's, that's, I'd love to see, I, I've not been able to contact Warren Onan. Um, and I, I was, I don't think, I can't recall. I read a lot of articles. <laughs> so I, 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 I kind of, I'm kind of trying to run to catch up here, but uh, I, I don't think he, I was able to actually see the research. It's not available online. I did corroborate um, those comments from different sources where, because he was actually interviewed in Japan about that. Um, I think, so So, so bearing in mind that um, the people that I work with, Global Voices and other, and I also work for on other projects too, it's in my Twitter bio, bearing in mind um, that the, in the world that I work in, people actually are very, very knowledgeable about uh, Twitter's content moderation. Th there were some people who are very knowledgeable that I spoke to about this, who, who also kind of wondered if, if what if that was true, if if in fact Twitter does focus on English language to the detriment of Japanese language content moderation. So I didn't I wasn't able to report on that, but but I think I think um, that's kind of I'd love to see like I'm being a bit presumptive here because I'm like I'm some guy and this is a person more Norman who, who specializes in this sort of thing and has, and has done empirical research. Be, so with that caveat in mind, I'd love to see the the, the research. So if, if he's listening, <laughs> please send me a link. Because <laughs> I, I look for it like on JSTOR and everywhere. I couldn't find it. And uh, but but I think I think that's like it, it, it's hard to say like what if if um, if Twitter does focus less on content moderation because it has the rest, less resources in Japanese. It's also very hypothetical that, that Twitter in Japan is somehow um, uh, closely aligned with the, the government. Because uh, it's sort of like, like if there's just sort of like these, these seeming connections where like the current CEO, whose name I forget, he's in Singapore now, he, he actually is now all of East Asia for Twitter. But he, I think he's got connections to the 
the the governing um, uh, Liberal Democratic Party and, and has done some consulting with them over the years. But like, it's you know you can't you can't prove anything, and so I think it, it's hard to say. Yeah. But I think, I mean, we, I think like generally speaking, like from my perspective, like any platform really struggles with like hate speech and, and, and far right type stuff. I'm, I'm not sure why there's lots of reasons it could be, but it, it's sort of a general problem. So it's not, I'm not sure if it's like Twitter's sort of nefarious promoting a, a nefarious right wing agenda. Who knows? Probably not. Well, I, it's interesting because in a few uh, critical accounts, famous Japanese uh, Twitter users who are critical of the government, their yeah. accounts were blocked um, at the same around <laughs> the same time with very yeah. little reasoning. Uh, this is what you're you're talking about in the article. So you know, yeah. it's it's hard to it draw accident. definites. Yeah, but. Uh, oh, we didn't mean to do that. Sorry about that. How did that happen? <laughs> it looks kind of fishy. Uh, oh, and kinda... then suddenly, and then it's like they, they, yeah. they, and suddenly after like somebody says something, the the comments are restored, the cast restored. Yeah, it is a bit fishy. Uh, kind of connected along the same kind of misinformation front is about vaccine misinformation, which you covered in this article, confronting vaccine hostility. In Japan, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Could you put that up on the screen? There we go. Did I really write that? Wow. Yeah, in June this year, oh, the news yeah. the news uh, cycle yeah. is changing so quickly. I write so much stuff, man. Like, um, I think the main point of that article was that, um, like, just like any results, there's vaccine hesitancy. Um, there's all sorts of like, as you know, as anybody who's probably watching this knows, there's all sorts of like really funky things. Like if you get the vaccine, you're a woman, you can't get pregnant. Like you'll be sterile, lots of stuff. Um, but I think, um, the, the main point of that article was like, uh, yeah, there's people who are vaccine hesitant. It's, it's, I don't think it's like, it's, it's, it's a significant number of people in Japan, but it's, it's also like Japan is now outstripped the United States. There's more people vaccinated per capita in, in Japan and the United States, for example. Not as much as Canada though. But uh, but but the thing is, is that there's just people talking about how to address vaccine hesitancy. And and uh, it's a it's a huge problem everywhere. Like it, like yesterday across Canada, including here in the capital city of Victoria, we're the capital of British Columbia, there's like like people like demonstrating against doctors at hospitals about the vaccines. Uh, and so I think I think the, 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 the main, in that article, like what I do is I found, um, I think going to, I think somebody quoted by 47 News, which is like a like a syndicate of, of local newspapers in Japan, like the 47 prefectures. They said like, um, you know, it's, it's important not to alienate people who are vaccine hesitant, which I think I is pretty relevant a... now. No, it's a really good point that you raise in that article. Uh, you talk about uh, Suchida Shoji, a professor yeah. of psychology and risk communication at Kansai University. He talks about how alienation can lead to more problems. So yeah. labeling and ostracizing vaccine hesitancy as saying those who oppose vaccines are strange makes things even worse. It is very dangerous for society when the only people to listen to and engage with the vaccine hesitant are cults and conspiracy theorists. And I thought that was a really important point to raise, that what we should do is when people say they're hesitant about the vaccine, listen to their reasons, maybe refer them to doctors and this real scientific evidence, as well as share your own story about getting vaccinated and maybe you had a fever or your own true experience, but try to lead them away kind of in a more accepting way, lead them away from following the radical misinformation, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good, I think, that made sense in June yeah, when I was writing it. But I think what's happening in Canada now, because we're, we're like um, ahead of the curve 
uh, on Japan, for example, in terms of the number of people vaccinated. So we're, I can't recall what the number is, but we're like well above 70%. Uh, and so what the government and how it's decided to do is, is to compel people to get vaccinated with the holdouts. And so we have a, a, vac like a so-called vaccine passport now, which I think Japan is also considering. So I think I think it worked. I think it works well early on. I don't know. Maybe, I'm, well, maybe the, the, the government would say that that that's sort of well. Let's be kind and reasonable. It's it still is important, but uh, I think what in Canada, which is like a few months ahead of Japan um, in terms of vaccinations, but I think what the government has decided here uh, is that um, you know, so there has to be like uh, a stick, which is a vaccine passport, and in so Canada. Uh, it means that you you need a you need to to provide uh, proof of vaccination if you want to go to a movie, or go to a restaurant, uh, go to a fitness like a, a gym, and that sort of thing. Uh, and so, for, I, I know that Japan is also considering a vaccine passport to roll out, I think in November or something. So, well, so Japan you, has, been, have have has been doing a great job uh, rolling out the vaccines recently. And it was nice to see, I saw Hiko Simon, who I talked with about the news the other day, uh, yeah. doing a tweet in, in Japanese saying how Taro Kono, who is now one of the main candidates for, as the new prime minister, uh, he was addressing the vaccine rumors as having no merit. And I thought, well, there's a nice, clear response coming from the government that you don't usually see. So that was that was nice to see. Yeah, he always has such great tweets, man. Always good for and a pithy you, quote. But you you were also translating a lot of the information. So you're translating from Japanese to English in inside yeah. your articles as well, right? That's right. Yeah. So another another gig I had for a while in, in the two uh, thousands was uh, I, I uh, rewrote um, television content and uh, fr from like Japanese to English, and that was like a great job. Uh, I got lots of money too. It, was, it paid really well. I bought a car with it. It's awesome. But uh, but one thing that I, I was supposed to do was to to write in idiomatic English because like if you do um, if you do like translations often they can it can be kind of stilted where people sort of capture the original like they, they capture like the direct translation of the japanese which doesn't work and so what i try to do is uh i try to to be as idiomatic like i try to capture like the the the, the intended tone and, and idiomatic quality of, of what's being said whenever possible so sometimes like it doesn't it, it sort of it doesn't it's not like a direct translation but it's how it's how you would sound if you were speaking in english and i had a really there's a really good one i did a while ago about um who's that guy like the sakurai the the far right leader and he had uh a meeting a showdown meeting with uh the, at that time the i think the mayor of osaka hashimoto and uh hashimoto called uh, sakurai uh like a bakayaro or something. And I translated that as, as you asshole. Because <laughs> that's sort of the, the intended intended uh, tone of it. But then I got like, I, I got a lot of comments. People were still commenting on blog posts back then. And I got a lot of comments saying, why did you translate that as, as, as asshole? That's not, it means you fool. It's like, no, no, it's not, it's not the tone. The, the, the actual, what he was trying to say, he was trying to be very emphatic about about uh, calling him an asshole. So anyways, that's what I, that's my approach to translation in, in, in my articles. Well, translation, uh, I've met and talked to many amazing translators like yourself over the years. And <laughs> it seems, but it's, it seems like you really have to do it case by case, that you really have to uh, read the room, so to speak, and capture the the atmosphere of what they were talking about, as well as doing the translation <clears throat> of the words. It's a very important part of translation and writing, I imagine. You're yeah. doing it in combination. Yeah. I, I, I'm also pretty careful about what I choose to, to incorporate in an article, like what tweets, because sometimes like, like um, people, like just in, like in English, people can't write very well. <laughs> And so, like the most brutal, impossible thing to do is to try to translate like a, a 
like a tweet that's grammatically incorrect in Japanese. Like you can't do it. And so I try to be careful also about like my source. I try to I try to select tweets that are are notable. Um because like 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 you can go online and you can find any kind of anybody saying anything to include in an article, but I want to make sure that there's like that there's like uh, tweets that are like relevant and notable, um, and also provide you know insights to like what people are actually thinking about or talking about. And and actually just just um, about to publish an article that uh, I work with a collaborator. We looked at the use of Twitter API to gauge uh, sentiment about the Olympics. So it should be going live tomorrow. We looked at like okay. 600,000 yeah. tweets or something. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, what you're trying to do, I found it really interesting, the style that you're using. You're trying to incorporate quotes from experts who you re reach out to, but you're also trying to, like you said before, incorporate the public voice. So social media tweets from influencers or people that are getting a lot of traction for what they're writing yeah. about, as well as doing your own research. So in this way, do you feel like journalism is, is evolving or changing over time? I don't think so, because this is like um, how Global Voices started out back in 2005, which is like um, doing the same style. Um, my stuff, like, like, like I, I've been writing regularly, like I'm uh, like on staff um, since 2014 as Japan News Editor. And so it's, I have this, I, I don't think it's evolved. I, I just think that we have a, it's a different journalistic style because it's more like, like the old citizen journalism that happened like, you know, 15 years ago, which is we sort of continue with it. But like, um, like a newsroom, or a correspondent. Well, first of all, they're typically in Japan. <laughs> and they're typically in Tokyo. And they're typically in the Foreign Correspondents Club, which so there's all these barriers to me being able to get access to to experts. And so it's it's much it's much easier to to find cool stuff on Twitter, um, like notable things like uh, politicians or Japanese journalists or commentators or looking at tabloids. It's it's, it's more, it's easier for me to, to find information that way. That said, like um, when I wrote for Kansai Time Out about 20 years ago, uh, you know, I wrote mostly on the environment, um, like nuclear power and aquaculture, climate change. And I could, I would just like phone up like, um, whoever, like, it's pretty cool. I would just phone them up and talk to a, a public affairs officer in like some Japanese municipal government about um, pine nematodes and how increasing temperatures were uh, making, like not killing off the nematodes and killing off the pines and that sort of thing. So yeah, I think it's just like, I don't think it's changing. It's just, that it's, it's easier for me to get I want to find good information, but I can't go to the foreign correspondence club and talk to, you know, whoever. Well, I'd love to dig up some of those articles. Those sound really interesting. Does Kansai Taiwan <laughs> have those have those online or logged somewhere? I'd love to. I'm find sure them. some of your uh, viewers uh, will be lamenting that it, it died a long time ago. It was a great magazine, but yeah, I, it's, it, I, I read think, it. I read it. Yeah. We, we didn't it's have gone. anything like it in Hiroshima. So that was our closest non-Tokyo uh, magazine. Um, but I, yeah. I like how, and you have this connection to Japan. You have this history in Japan. You understand Japanese language as well as culture. But now that you're outside Japan, you're able to talk to different experts related to the topics about Japan. And I think it's important because it's expanding the conversation. It's not just about this one news story in Tokyo. It's bigger than that. And so these, these stories that you're writing about, although they might seem very specific and small, I think they do have a, a much wider reach. So I do appreciate the articles and the topics you're choosing and the style that you're using. So keep up the good work. Oh, thanks. I appreciate you too for having me on. <laughs>
That's awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining. Uh, we had some comments from Dan H on uh, YouTube. He's talking about uh, in India, a uh, journalist was criticized, um, dismissed fake news on Twitter about cow dung. So it's, it's always a battle, right? Like finding misinformation and trying to keep authenticity, accountability, transparency. We need to rely more on journalists who do their research and get information from a variety of sources like you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Very gratifying. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nevin. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Take care.